Tell me when the little live thing goes live. Sure. I'm trying to light this cedar and it's not working. Looks live. We are we are yeah, live. Yeah. Sorry, I was very distracted for a second. I was not. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We are live on the What's On It Elephant and Castle Facebook page. Um, my name is Nick. Um, I'm just doing the page sharing stuff right now. Um, so please bear with me as we get ready to talk to Kaylee Hombo and then Melissa's over in Toronto. Yes, hello. So first of all, Kaylee, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're an artist uh, with experience delivering community and well-being classes and workshops. You've spent four years working specifically with migrant and refugee youth at different capacities. And currently you're focusing on your painting and drawing practices and raising awareness around women's issues uh, and the destigmatization, destigmatization of their bodies. And I'm a huge, huge fan of yours and I, uh, I adore what you're doing. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, how, how is everything going? Well, that's a broad question. Um, yeah, it's tricky times for me and for many and for different reasons, but it's good. I'm being creative because I'm kind of in lockdown. So I've got a lot more time to make art. I've had a lot more time to make art, which is um, a privilege. And so I'm lucky in that sense, but also it's been tricky work-wise because obviously a lot of work has disappeared. So yeah. I, I can imagine, and just for the, the the what's on an elephant and castle Facebook community, that you know, um, to just to kind of get to know you, can you give us a little rundown of of who you are and how you got to where you are today? Yes. So I've been working. I've been living in London for about seven years, and um, during my art degree, I started um, volunteering in a women and girls center. Uh, working with different groups of youth in London and then when I finished that degree about four years ago I was offered a job at that women and girls center which is in South London um, and a lot of the community I worked with were from Elephant and Castle so I worked with a lot of Latin American migrant uh, young women children and their families I worked with um, migrants and refugees from other backgrounds as well and I ran a project an education program for for refugee and migrant youth um, in South London for for a while and part of that was delivering arts and well-being and confidence workshops as well as teaching English and helping uh, young people get into school so kind of fast track to last year I left that position and I decided I wanted more time to make art and dedicate myself to my art practice and then I didn't want to let go of that migrant and refugee work because it's so fulfilling and I love it and it's important. And so I found um, another charity that I could do freelance work with so I could work less hours and focus entirely on arts and well-being workshops. So rather than run the whole kind of project, I just go into organizations on a freelance basis and I deliver arts and work arts and well-being workshops. And that was happening until like a few days before lockdown and then all of that stopped. But uh, meanwhile, I've been doing kind of well-being and uh, English focused and sometimes arts focused workshops with young people on Zoom. So I'm volunteering, I'm not working at the moment, but I'm doing two sessions a week. So one with a group of refugee girls and one with a one-to-one -one who's learning English from scratch an unaccompanied minor boy. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of really into using arts and well-being, but also teaching English. And then on alongside that, I'm into my practice, which is quite different, which is on Instagram and which is a lot to do with painting uh, the nude body and looking at women's issues. Because my, my majority of my work um, with migrant and refugee community is women and girls. I worked in a women and girls centre. There was only female staff, only female young people. So I didn't actually work as much with boys. So my, my, I suppose my passion is, is women's rights. And then now I'm looking at it from quite a different angle in my art practice. Mm. Yeah. Um, go, sorry, no, go Nick. Okay, so um, what I, the, the, the one that I wanna kind of go off the bat with, with is the, the migrant and refugee um, work, work that you do. And I, I was once, I was in Toronto and, and somebody from a, from a, um, a refugee um, home was saying how important it is for people when they come to a new country, sometimes they have to actually give up their paint sets 
or their drawing books so that they could make space for say their children's clothes and that they they're when they're they're moving you know because of certain circumstances they're losing part of their identity yeah. how important has it been for you to be able to help um you know people coming to a new country to keep engaged with their artwork um incredibly important i also feel like it's an access um issue so i'm privileged i've been able to go to university i've been able to go to school i'm white i've had a lot of things that have been on my side that would help me get the art career that i want and then we have people who haven't got the same privileges as us and obviously coming from a war-torn country maybe with a lot of trauma or maybe economically um, very difficult and coming to a new country maybe art and making art is not a priority you're just trying to live and survive in the first uh, few months and then you're trying to find school and then you're trying to find housing and you know art, art may not be a priority because it just isn't and so you know using the arts in in, in workshops uh, is, is, is allowing people who may not be able to access art um, that opportunity just to create and in my experience it's just a really mindful um, lovely experience to sit in a group together and create art and often the migrant groups I've worked with are mixed so they may not speak each other's languages so art kind of breaks down some of the language barriers so you might have to teach some technique but really most people can sit together and make art together whether they can speak or not it can be quite a quiet activity so yeah I think it's really important I think um, there's real talent that I've witnessed and it's really important to nourish that talent because it's in the face of a lot of adversity and so you know it is really important to to engage artistically with people all the time all groups of people should be should be engaging in art practice i think oh, my turn um yeah. i think uh like there's so many things i can ask you at this point but i think maybe just to maybe speak a bit about what you've witnessed around the healing or transformation transformation i mean you've already tapped on the kind of universal language of art where we might not have to speak, we might not speak the same language, but to create is kind of, we can all do that as long as we are in the space to do that. So can you speak a bit to what you've seen like happen or what you were privileged to witness in terms of maybe somebody's confidence or ability to share around this space you've allowed to create, like the space you've created for people to express themselves, I guess, or reconnect with themselves? Yeah, so I've run, not now, but before I used to run art clubs for London youth, so from young people from different backgrounds, it wasn't necessarily a migrant background, it could be from London, and what I found is that um, they may be able to express something in art that they're not able to express verbally, because actually asking young people to tell you their feelings is actually really hard, um, because they're kids and they have there are different stages in their brains and they're not meant to have the same articulation as an adult so for example I remember someone who's quite introvert made a piece which seemed quite disturbing um, and through that piece uh, we were able to to ask that young person what does this mean to you I, I, I was kind of told by another club lead who I was managing that this was happening and this art came out from from this session and when I spoke to that young person they were able to describe what the situation was which was a lot about how they felt in classrooms and how they felt that they could not speak and they could not use their voice and I, I realized in that moment that had that person that young person not made the art she, she may never have been able to tell me that um, and it was a really important factor she was a, she was a recently arrived migrant who was having trouble trying to express herself in lessons and she found that through artwork, she was able to communicate to us rather than being able to tell us that. So I think that's really one example. But obviously, yeah. in terms of that confidence, yeah, for sure. I think that um, a lot of, we made a recently this year, we did a dream catcher workshop with predominantly um, boys, young men. There were about um, 20 young men, I believe, um, from many different countries, almost mostly unaccompanied minor. Uh, children so maybe 14 and above and they all made dream catchers and dream catchers look quite daunting they look very in intricate they look like something that I didn't even know we actually me and my co-facilitator created them on the day so I didn't think that I'd be able to do it because it just looks impossible but actually everyone can make a dream catcher and we could you could buy kind of reasonably cheap materials so it's accessible mm -hmm. and you watch and, and and maybe dream catchers has like a kind of 
maybe maybe like a feminine stereotypically connotation but in the end all the young men were completely immersed and they made beautiful dream catchers and they and they had their own take on it that's what's really important that if we didn't have one look of a dream catcher they made completely different dream catchers with different parts with different designs and they just went for it for like I think an hour and a half or so and it was just you know just showing someone that you can do something that you don't think you can is, is really important I think and then they you know they got beautiful objects as well hanging up in their space so yeah like a representation of their unique identity sorry that's all I know Nick I keep cutting him off when he wants to talk but yeah it's so lovely go on Nick no I Kaylee what we try to do is we try to alternate questions um yeah. but, but Melissa always comes in with two or three questions so I just let her run with it but well because I mean there's a flow I'm trying to honor and I don't like this very strategic planned out back and forth anyway that's just about me Go on. <laughs> you know, like I, what 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 got me thinking is that is that you know art's always subjective, and we go to art galleries and we go to museums and we see art through the past and through the history, and it's always somebody something that's done by someone who's really good at it. You know, and and for me, like I, I'm just I can't even draw a stick person like that looks like a, a person that looks like a stick person. I mean, I'm really bad at it. Um, and for me, it feels like it's something that I can never express. You know, maybe maybe through words or something like that, poetry. But how do you encourage somebody who who you know they 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 they're you know they're 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 trying to express something and they're just not very good at it? You know, whereas art is you know I look at your stuff and I'm I'm blown away at it and I'm like I'm I could never do anything like that, so I can't be an artist. You know, so how do you encourage people just to be able to express themselves? Yeah, I think it's it's sad because I think a lot of people love drawing, but everyone says I'm not good at it. Yeah, so I know I admit that I have technique and I have a process, so I have this let's say it called like a talent. But also, what I've what is important in a, in a workshop is to bring in other artists that maybe draw very differently. So, for example, Basquiat, um, his characters, um, I, I brought them into one of the sessions with the young refugees because he was they, he was relatable to them. Uh, they were me, they were men and uh, they were young boys or, or men that I was, I was teaching. And, and I, I think it was really important for them to look at Basquiat's art because those those paintings are one of some of the most famous, most uh, admired paintings in the world. And yet they don't have that kind of precision in the sense that it doesn't capture the body in reality. The face doesn't have like three dimensional qualities necessarily. It doesn't have that kind of like stereotypically good drawing and it is incredibly powerful and emotive and just like having conversations about artists that don't use that kind of technique which is a lot of modern contemporary art um which is really popular is not that kind of drawing and, and then realizing that that's admired as well as the kind of more technical side and kind of just stopping using that language encouraging people not to say i'm good at or bad at yeah that kind of thing and, and being playful so like making there's like drawing games you can do in workshops that can so for example, continuous lines. So you're drawing someone's portrait and you're literally not taking your hand off the paper. So you're ending up communally making strange, non-technical drawings that everyone kind of likes. And then you just realize it's not about good drawing. That's what I think. Yeah, it's like um, putting yourself in the position to be judged. If you're like putting that pressure on whether or not you're a good thing or a bad thing, it's like so much pressure. Um, I'm gonna ask maybe, can you speak a bit about your own creative process? Cause I know for me in the last couple of months that I've been tapping into different parts of myself um, with my writing anyway, like, I'm like, what is my process? How do I honor the creative spirit? But how do I have a routine, but also be intuitive in my work? And how do I, you're like exhaling. I don't know if this is a loaded <laughs> question for you, but I'm- It's hard, it's hard. It's so hard because, you know, uh, I was talking with my friend who's a filmmaker. We're talking about the, the process of creating and it's so different for people. Um, and I heard this quote from someone who I, I really can't remember, but he said like, when I, when I sit down at night, I sit down at 7 a.m. every day and the muse knows where to find me. So mm -hmm. my position stays rather than this, like I think what we hear around like this intuitive kind of, oh, I've just been called, I've been spoken um, to create this thing. And then you have the flip side of like, this is where I am. I will wait to be inspired. I'm not changing. So there's like these big, these different dynamics of what creativity or the process of create creation means. So, I mean, that's a question in itself, but for you, what's been your creative kind of process like? Well, it's changed a lot recently because, and as I mentioned, I'm kind of 
you know, I'm not working full time um, and I'm using most of my time to make art. So right now it's more like I'm like exploding, like some kind of volcano and I can't stop and I paint anytime and it doesn't really have any rhythm. And actually, if I say anything, I don't have much like balance. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend I do that. I have a miracle way of looking at creativity. I wish I did, but no, I kind of make, I mean, it's kind of new to me that I'm creating so much. It's been years because actually a lot of my practice has been facilitating workshops for other people to make art. And obviously I might make some alongside it, but it's not, that's not the focus. So to focus on my practice recently in lockdown has just been like kind of um, relentless creativity in terms of painting and drawing. It feels like a big burst and I'm, I'm afraid of it kind of dwindling. So I'm kind of rolling with that. Um, and also just, you know, realizing that not everyone is going to like it and some people will resonate and that um, I found that committing to my practice, again, has been really difficult sometimes because although some people understand some of the principles behind my work and they really resonate and it means a lot to them because um, it's about bodies and being a woman and all being in a body. It doesn't have to be about being a woman, but often is. And, and I, and I realize and it involves um, nudity. And so that's been my creative process, really painting a lot of naked bodies, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. And so um, that has not gone down well with everyone, but it's gone down well with a lot of people. And I suppose what I've realized is that not everyone's going to like it. And art, art is supposed to be, or can be, doesn't have to be thought provoking. And some of those thoughts are not going to be ones that you, you would like, you know? And I think that what my creative process is now is about not caring as much what other people think and really believing it for myself and kind of going for it because I've been not doing that for a long time because I was very fearful of judgment. But I realized that to be honest, people are always going to have different opinions about our creative um, endeavors. And I suppose that's their right to not like it and not enjoy it. And then the people who do appreciate them. That's what I would say, appreciate what I do have, which is a lot of wonderful community that do really understand what I'm trying to do so yeah it's quite personal at the moment I feel like um you know when I was uh looking at your art and like Nick has mentioned you for a while so I am familiar with you and your work and like the thing I get from it is this like this sense of like maybe you don't feel this way but this is how I receive it is um this unapol unapologetic kind of like this is the body, this is the the woman form a set a, a specifically um, that I related to. And like this idea of, we need to um, get rid of the shame around the bodies we walk, walk in, especially as women in this context, right? There's so much, basically we can't do anything right. If we dress one way, we, we're wrong. If we dress another way, we're wrong. If we sleep with a bunch of people, we're wrong. If we don't sleep with anyone, we're wrong. Like all these kind of like different ways of being and our representations of our body. So for me, there was this like almost freedom and like lack of needing somebody's um, like, what's the word? Consent, not consent is not the right word, but like appreciate approval. That's the word I was looking for. Like the unapologetic kind of like this is our body and it's beautiful and it's wise and it's powerful and just take it like yeah. basically take it so anyway that was my kind of it was that like an intention or that just yeah, came definitely I mean I think it's a pretty yeah I think I make it pretty loud and clear what I'm trying to say I'm pretty pretty direct about my views about um the massive double standard that exists for female bodies and male bodies and how women are constantly sexualized and blamed um, for sexual assault, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and kind of um, constantly being told to control their bodies and cover their bodies and what, sh what should be done with their bodies. It's a very weird thing. It's almost like there's a whole, you know, percentage of the population kind of talking about our bodies in a way that's very um, toxic, I think. And so, you know, the nude form, I suppose it's not really even about nudity, even though of course it is, it's like loads of you know, nude paintings, but it is about the fact that it's a, it's a nude body that seems to evoke as the most reaction from people in the sense that people have sexualized it to such a degree that they can't like separate it. Because actually we're naked in our homes quite a lot. You know, we take showers naked, we do other things naked, but because we live in a culture where, if I'm honest, most people see nudity on porn. So they're gonna be relating, well, nudity that's not their own or their partners or their maybe their young children or whatever, that that's the nudity they might experience in their home life. But 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 when we're exposed to it in the media or, you know, it's it's terrible because it's it's completely sexualized. So if we see nudity in a film, it's probably because they're having sex. And if we see nudity in porn, it's probably pretty 
toxic mainstream madness. So then you see the nude figure and the female figure, which is particularly like, you know, the whole world's obsessed with female nurse, like they're obsessed with the, with the woman. And so then, you know, you've got a naked body and, and people can't stop seeing that, you know, they, they think it's just provocative, but actually it's just our bodies. We can do what we want. And um, for me uh, as an adult woman and, and for the adult people that I paint, because it's really important, you know, to say that they're all adults and consenting and consent is really important. So anyone that I have painted on my Instagram has consented with me. You know, we've agreed that that's something we'd like to do. For, for, for me, it's about telling stories. So often I, I put a quote that they've told me. I don't want to talk for them. And I want to learn how to tell people stories because it's something I'm interested in. And they, they talk about their, their journeys with their bodies. And, and most women, or, and men, definitely, but I speak to more women, um, have really horrible relationships with their bodies. They've, they've had to work so hard to get to a point of any happiness with their bodies, including myself. So for them to paint, to be painted and honoured uh, nude it's, it's a really a big celebration and a kind of yeah this is me you know with all my my flaws so yeah I think it's it's very much about control as well and like defying that because obviously if those pictures were not painted obviously I'd be you know I'd be banned off Instagram that's for sure <laughs> and and that says a lot it's very it's interesting painting allows us to look at things without it being it's like almost it's, it's a bit closed like the painting has a layer which means it's not so offensive that people are going to be like whoa you know yeah yeah does that make sense i i want to say things but i'm just going to say nick go because oh, I, I, i'm going to say that i think that this is flowing and i'm just stepping back and listening here so mel <laughs> <you> ask, yes <laughs> no i just mean like there is there is so much around this objectification and um also like fear of the body and we we i think we're grown to like disconnect from the true like sacredness of what a body can be and especially yeah. I mean, I'm not dissuading or not including men in this conversation because the male body, I mean, is so important as well. And it's been harmed, like it can be harmed the same way. But in, from my experience, like in terms of the body, it's meant my relationship with the body, my body has not been a kind one, right? Like I, I almost hated it for such a long time for betraying me for things that I had no control over. It's like, how dare you body? So there was such a disconnect between my heart or my spirit or whatever and the body. And then the more I started learning and, and kind of healing, yeah. I realized that actually they are allies and the work toward making them allies was the, what some of the hardest work I've ever like had to do. And I still actively do it. I don't think we ever stop, I yeah. just think, like our the in between points lesson and the harm between the in between points lesson a bit. But anyway, I don't know if that's a question. I had a question, but now I'm all like distracted yeah. in my own mind of bodies and stuff. Yeah, but it's important. That's the whole point is to share the experience. Yeah. That's what it's all about. It's about people's experience and the wide experience of women and girls is that they grew up hating their bodies. And I'm yeah. and what's wild is that I'm supposed to be a body, I'm an able bodied you know, white woman, and yet I've grown up, like I, I'm, I'm the privileged person body-wise, but I've grown up hating my body, and that says a lot, that says so much, because that means that everyone hates their bodies, even if they're born into, well, not everyone, that's a huge generalization, but many, 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 many people grew up hating their bodies, even if they fit the kind of westernized right. standard, they still hate their bodies, so it shows how thick the culture is, if, 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 it, if it really seems to apply to everyone that I've spoken to online and, and in my life. So it's just, I think it's terribly sad. What a waste of time to hate yeah. our bodies. <laughs> it's so interesting. It's just a learned thing. It's just, we were taught it or we're exposed to like, that this is what a body needs to serve, which is not your own sense of self. Our body, yeah. especially women's bodies, um, are like for men's pleasure. And again, this is a very heteronormative conversation, but like, like that context like women's pleasure and bodies yeah. not for themselves their agency doesn't lie within themselves it's essentially to serve someone else yeah and when we're young kids and, and girls uh growing up uh, that's what we're taught whether the ver it's a verbalized to us we're seeing it right we're seeing it played out over and over in the people and in the media in our lives whether we agree with it or not right yeah and I think that thing about the pleasure nude, so like if you think about a nude, if you hear that word, you just assume, I reckon most people would assume like hetero woman sends nudes to man. Like I feel like that's like the first kind of connotation to nude and it's for his pleasure. 
not for hers. And I think that's what's interesting about drawing and painting people's nudes or my own actually, because I paint myself often, is that it kind of like changes that direction. So it's like, oh, these nudes could exist for like another purpose, not to serve male pleasure, like how radical. And, and I think that's really important. It's like those nudes, I think that's what's nice about the experience. And when I've sp spoken to the women that I painted that they love it, you know, because it's totally different. You know, it's a different ball game. Also when nudes are quite flippant, so they're sent quite quickly um, and they're not, you know, they just seem like a quite impulsive idea. And then with a nude that obviously if I'm painting that nude, I'm, I'm going to spend quite a long time on it. So I'm hoping that that feels like some kind of honoring. That's the hope, um, you know, that, that that nude is honored, not just something that, you know, and also that we've got, you know, other issues where nudes are being spread around by men and, and boys. And there's all sorts of really difficult political problems within the nude, like and sexual abuse, sexual harassment. So the nude is quite a loaded um, word now, as in mm. you know, women in certain cultures could be, you know, killed um, for sending a nude. Uh, in a, you know, this is really quite something. And so, you know, it's tricky. It's tricky to, to try and reclaim that. And I'm still starting the journey. So I'm sure that I'll learn more as I go along because I haven't been doing this for that long. So I'm sure I'll learn new things I hadn't thought about. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure people will challenge me and I'm up for that because yeah. as I said, I'm just beginning this kind of journey of like trying to tell stories through nudes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Nick, do you want to say something or do you want me to finish? You know, I'd like to come in just as, 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 as a man who has been guided by, by both of you. <coughs> Melissa is a guide, Kaylee, you've been a guide to me. Um, you know, as that that hetero white man who who sits in the position where you know the advertising industries, the beauty industries are all run by men who look like me. You know, the power positions, and through your artwork and through your message, you know, what are the things? So, so how you know it's about unlearning stuff, right? It's about unlearning this privilege and these power positions, and 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 so the the message is that I imagine through your artwork is not only to women, but if men were to see it what would be the thing that you would like them to take away from it? Do something about it. That's what I would like to say. Just don't sit there and look at the news and, 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 and you know, just, I mean, I guess to be honest, I can't control my male audience. And I'm sure a lot of them aren't getting the picture whatsoever because I have some really strange male followers and very unbounded and predatory ones. But um, I have some really great male followers who have really interesting conversations with me, who totally get it, who are like really impassioned with me, who send me private messages to affirm and validate what I'm saying and that's that's a really good start but obviously it's not enough so it'd be like okay so then you're with a man and he's talking in a really derogatory way about a woman he slept with maybe about her body maybe about oh she's hairy gross I wouldn't do that or she's um got a funny vagina or something like that you know what mental I, I I don't know I'm pretty I'm assuming that sometimes men can be pretty gruesome because I've seen it myself and I think that that's that's when it's harder it's, it's probably easier for them to be like you know, yes, Kaylee, we, we, we stand behind you, behind a screen, you know, on Instagram, that's quite an easy, it's really great, it's fantastic, I invite that, but I would like it to go further than that. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna call out your male friends? You know, are you gonna actually start having conversations with your sons, your brothers, your friends? Because honestly, men listen to men, in my experience, much more than they do to me or to other women. And especially the kind of man that, I'm not, you know, I'm not really trying to change, you know, woke men who already have really like feminist principles and, that's probably not, although I think they're still got like some serious internalized misogyny in my experience is still there. But I think it's like the men who are the most, the ones who are really, you know, per perpetrating like these kind of awful um, objectification. And, and when you see it at work, when you see it in the pub, when you see it in all these different areas, like what are you going to do? That's what I'm interested in. Like, are you going to call it out or are you just going to sit back and be like, oh, this is too uncomfortable. And I think that's, that's what the aim of the game would be for men to take more action. Because actually, to be honest, it's exhausting. Like I, I sometimes I just think, nah, like this is too much. Like trying to trying to prove my point is quite an exhausting thing um, because you'll have so many men saying, even on Instagram, awful things to me when I'm trying to prove my point. You know, shave you minger or can I lick your armpits because I've got hairy armpits or you know you've got so much of that at the same time simultaneously as all the positive feedback and like kind of it's really hard to know if it's if it's really making the effect that I want on my male audience because 50 percent of them don't respect me at all <laughs> so I have no idea I can't I'd have to interview them I don't want to ever yeah fair point it's like it's I mean I've been this has been in my mind for the last couple of days with an experience I had um like with workshops I'm running for women ver versus um men and just like like 
tuning into the energy of it and for my own safety of like I can go deeper quickly with women than I can with men and like what that speaks to about my own experience with men and my own kind of like hesitation and not trusting myself in the space of men but also thinking well I'm the facilitator of this so I have to in a sense facilitate but yeah. recognizing I come with a certain experience that has taught me that I'm not going to be safe yeah right and so that's such an interesting like um an interesting kind of place mental and emotional place to sit with knowing that I want to do this and I've been privilege to be able to create a space for these conversations to happen like you with your artwork but yeah. also recognize it's personal for us we're not objective because our experiences are speaking our truth yeah and yeah, how yeah. do we like negotiate the truth and our experience and our our wanting to facilitate conversations and cultural kind of question cultural norms um yeah i'm starting to read a book uh just starting called pleasure activism and that's okay interesting idea that someone recommended to me because I often burn out to be honest in my creative process whether it be working with young people or trying to change the world and end misogyny on my Instagram I feel like I can burn out quite quickly because I put like ridiculous amounts of pressure on myself and maybe that is a female trait like as well like being taught to carry the world on our shoulders which is why I want the men in general to take the load of trying to end this misogynist rubbish because it's exhausting and burns burns women out who are trying to be kind of activists um yeah, I, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> what was it? Where were we going I, with it? I think what I, I think what maybe I was getting at, what you were oh, getting at. Yeah. Yeah, like how do you center yourself when you are, or how do you lessen, how do you come back from a burnout or lessen before the burnout happens? Or how do you come back to yourself, to you, um, with all this kind of public perceptions or public thinking everyone knows what's right for you and your body and your work how do you find yeah, your support it's really it's just really difficult for me the most important thing in my personal life is to find a community of people whether it be online but obviously very importantly offline who really get the message and who support me 100 and accept me whatever i choose to do with my body online or offline as an adult and um, those people probably like literally the reasons i'm living today um, and so, you know, unfortunately, you know, there are people in my life who really, really disagree quite profoundly with some of the things I'm doing. And that's OK. I guess, you know, people are different. Um, but I think that, you know, to be honest, in lockdown, it hasn't been that easy to I have you know, usually we'd have more distractions. So I don't know how to describe it. Like I feel like because there's not as many distractions, like pleasurable ones, like going to the cinema or having some time off to go to a concert or something, then I wouldn't be in my head thinking about these world issues like 24 hours a day. But I think many people in lockdown and it's, 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 they've, they've been overthinking, you know, because we've been more exposed to like social media. And so I think probably getting off the social media more hours a day would probably help me like practically. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, you know, in the end, it's just one window. You know, one one can feel that they're making a change, and I think there is impact on social media. But but for me, it's really important as well to have like um, other things that I do. So walk the talk, yeah. So I do the you know the girl group on a Tuesday with the young migrant refugees and keep it practical because sometimes all the theory and the thoughts can be very interesting and empowering, but can feel really overwhelming. So putting it into practice helps me. But I think, yeah, so it's quite hard if I'm honest, because I'm pretty raw on my social media and that is what people often like. But I think that people don't, maybe don't understand what that comes with the price. You know, that's really hard. Like, it's not like I'm just like, yeah, listen to my darkest, deepest fears and let's talk about sexual trauma. Like, it's not a hobby, you know, it's really tough. Sometimes I, I, I cry or I go to bed after I post something because it's too, I've literally, went, once I went to bed after I posted something all day because I talked about sexual trauma. So, you know, I think people should appreciate that people online, who are talking about traumatic things, like be kind to them because they're often suffering for it. Like it's not just for fun. I'm not, I mean, in a way I'd rather not, I'd rather all these things hadn't happened. I'd rather that the world just liked women and loved them and respected them. Then I wouldn't have to make art about it. Um, I guess I don't have to, but I choose to, but still I feel like people really should understand that people online who are trying to make a difference really are trying, like they're not doing it just for fun. They're doing it because it comes from a very personal experience and that experience is deeply traumatic. And that has been my biggest trauma, like that kind of sexualization of my body, the abuse that comes with that, and the victim blaming the fact that it's always been blamed on my body and on me, rather than it, until I'm, I was an adult really and seeking my own support, I've, I've been often blamed for the things that have happened to me. And I think 
the, the, the idea of using the nude body to illustrate like I will do what I want because I am an adult woman and I am allowed to paint myself nude when museums and galleries are full of nudes by men, male photographers, right. male directors, male artists, male painters, painters who painted children naked when they were, I mean, we're talking old paintings like Gauguin, like they were painting girls naked and we, we, we study that in history of art. Yeah, I, I paint myself naked as an adult consenting to myself. Right. And that's like radical. I mean, that says a lot about our culture. It's completely upside down. You know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, especially old museums are full of nudes of women by men. And who would have, you know, who knew? I, I can't, I can speculate that there were abusive dynamics in some of those paintings. You know, those women would have been incredibly powerless at that time because they had no rights. So what was happening behind the painting? You know, so that's why I'm like, yeah, I can do what I want. Please let me paint myself in peace. But it's not that peaceful because people get really angry. <laughs> um, Nick, I'm looking no, at you. Go ahead, you go ahead. Um, I mean, again, I don't know. I have so many thoughts and everything you said is spot on. And it, it is very much a, like um, what we've taken as the, as the truth, as the baseline, which is men's perspective on women's bodies and not just in art, but in like how to use them, how to treat them, how to like, it, we're just objects, I think for, for, uh, for again, like we said, men's pleasure. And I think what's so important, what, what seems, hap I think you raise a couple of points. So uh, the thing around social media, which I'm appreciating around your social media, because there's a rawness and a vulnerability that is present. That's not about getting likes to get sponsored, to get money, to get a thing where sometimes social media has only been used for that, right? Is to look at, look at the body in a way that's again, reinforcing can be reinforcing ideas of sexuality. At the same time, if a woman wants to pose in a bikini and that's empowering for her, that's welcomed. But then you have people like, you're just like, I, I'm trying to not say swear words, but you know the words we you can use for women, right? Um, so like you can be, it's an empowering act for the woman, but then people are seeing it as disempowering. Yeah. So how, where does power lie and agency lie in all the conversations around media? So you, hearing you say you're using your platform as a way to almost like share your story and like witness yourself in the trauma that's happened to you and to maybe let somebody else who's experienced the same trauma feel not so alone in it. Yeah. Like, oh, if it's happened to you and it's happened to me, then then maybe it's not my fault. And so there's this, yeah, go on. I think you're going to say something. Me? No, I was listening. Oh, no. Oh, oh. yeah. Um, so definitely and hopefully I think by healing it's also like yes I do center myself in many of my paintings but I also paint a lot of people and I did like a sexual sorry a street harassment project recently that was published in a, in a magazine online and it was just really kind of I wasn't expected to be published I just did it as in like got loads of women asked loads of women if they wanted to share with me their 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 experiences of being harassed on the street obviously every single woman you know but i painted right. their portraits and you know honored them and their stories so and it wasn't nude it wasn't even about being nude it was also just about people and women and that is you know part of that whole big issue is that you know these women were were clothed you know when they were sexually and and racially and uh you know violently harassed on the streets you know so it's got nothing to do with nudity and I think this is why we've got like a really skewed idea of nudity in that whether it means we're powered or disempowered because actually if you're clothed and you're walking down the street and you're so powerless that you're being you know violated harassed racially and sexually abused on the street fully clothed in your normal clothes it says that it has nothing to do with nudity it's like proof you know and so the, the whole idea of being obsessed with whether women are empowered or disempowered in fact it's no one to say it's actually only that woman's choice whatever she does with her body you know whether she she uses it to make money whether she posts it in a certain way in a way she is the one who will tell will be able to tell you if she's empowered or disempowered that's her experience we talk about it as if we know we're judges and I, I don't like it we talk we don't talk about men that way we don't go oh men are men empowered or disempowered like oh he posted like a shirtless uh picture on the beach I feel like he's saying he's empowered, but he's just not empowered. It's just a bizarre, we just wouldn't say it. Like, oh, he's shown a bit of his, you know, we just don't talk about men that way. We only talk about women and actually just up to women, whether they're empowered or disempowered. It just, it, it drives me mad. It's like, someone told me because of my Instagram, they're like, but you say you're empowered, but I was like, but what? 
but what, but I show myself naked in, in paintings. Does that mean I'm fundamentally disempowered? Like, I, I, it's quite sick, this idea, really, that, that it's anything to do with showing your body or not, you know? I don't know, it could do. I'm not saying, like, when I was younger, and I was a teenager, that was a different ball game. So I would walk around the streets, you know, uh, wearing revealing clothes, and I was very disempowered in myself because of many experiences, and I was completely reliant on male attention and validation. That happened, and that was a very different time in my life, in my late teens, early 20s. And I would tell you that it had something to do with trying to get validation and being hooked on that and needing that male validation. But but we can, we can move forward, and then as adults, reinvent that and, and ensure, you know, it, it's kind of, it's malleable. I feel like it's not fixed, you know, it's not like, oh, and then I wore shirts up to there and I was okay for the rest of my life. Like, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, it speaks to the, de it's a mindset, right? It's an actual learning around our, our respect and our like interaction with like what lives we are deemed, we deem are worthy or unworthy based on our own like position and privilege in the world and the way it's worked it's been dominated by white men and women's bodies and like um queer bodies black bodies brown have just been at the lower end of that spectrum and it seems like that's why there's always a conversation because it's like we are even in this conversation questioning why why that's become the way we have to continue to, to like to challenge because mm. Because what I keep asking my, or what I think a lot is like, there's just this fragility around the male ego that, that holy, oh my God, if you give women or let them think they have power, even though it's none of my business, if they have power, then, then what happens about us? We have to question our own sense of self as a white, like male privileged kind of person. So I guess what I'm saying is like, what are people so afraid of, especially men? Like, what are you so afraid of? Nick, obviously not you because you're creating spaces for women too. But I know in our conversations, it's like, I, I don't get it. Like, why can't we just mind our own business about everyone like honoring their own body? That's my question. What are people so afraid of yeah, around so equality? Awesome. Yeah, Nick, answer the question, Nick, this is for you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know what, I wouldn't know what to say about what they're, what people are afraid, what men are afraid of. I know that from, from my perspective is that, um, you know, Kaylee, a few months ago, you and I had a conversation about an experience that you had and that from that, me listening to you about that and from me listening to Melissa, two people that I care about, you know, was born tender as the new tough really. Um, which is going to be a platform for men who look like me to be able to discuss these issues and for me to, to be able to ask what what are you guys afraid of what are we afraid of you know why does street harassment exist what are you getting out of it and then for me to be able to tell them in my experience my female friends are actually scared actually scared going to you know getting on a bus getting on a tube going, and and for me to be able to tell them that hopefully they will then their perspective will change and, and, and say, instead of it being harmless boy banter, it's actually harmful actions towards women. And then that I think is where change is gonna be created, where, where men can actually listen to this conversation here and go, wow, I, I didn't know that that was actually happening. Um, so you, do, you, do you understand? Yeah, I mean, but, but what is their fear of female sexuality and beauty and why do they want to like kill it and squash it and harass it and abuse it? Why do you think that might be the case? I, I, I honestly, I, I can Yeah, I'd say it's, it, it is, it's power, right? It's mm -hmm. like a kind of essence of this is the power that we have. So we've been bought up to say that our bodies, I weigh twice as much as you guys, I can lift twice as much. So that makes me more powerful. And I think it's this perception of power of, of saying, because physically power is power when obviously it isn't. And I think it's this, now it's this journey of the, of, of understanding that that isn't what power, true power is, you know, true power is in showing vulnerability and in saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong to have done that. And I think it's in this journey, it's a journey of, of understanding. It's the fear of, of losing power or of not recognizing what real power is. Well, it's the fear of, of knowing yourself and knowing that you can also be okay without having to have this bravado of some shit that you have everything figured out and these notions of like what it means to be a provider and success and successor, no, and have success and like all these things. 
but it, so it comes down to like the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we were taught or told around what being a decent, uh, a proper person uh, looks like. And again, to, Kay to Kaylee's point before, it comes from like the history. Like if an art history course is like, actually this is Van Gogh and Van Gogh was actually problematic for one, two, three, four, five, or Picasso, sorry, like for all these reasons, then that shifts the narrative and that shifts our relationship with understanding beauty and art and expression, right? Because we're getting a whole context, the whole story, not just the one sentence of a one chapter based on this one event. We're actually allowed to read the whole book and see our perspective differently. And I, so I think the like calling men kind of taking the responsibility as Hay Hay Kaylee mentioned and Nick, what ten, what we're doing with tenders and tough, tough is like, I'm the one like being scared and having to navigate, making sure I'm not walking home at this time, or I have to look somebody in the eyes, or if somebody buys me a drink, I have to say no, or I have to not say I'm single. I have to say I have a boyfriend because God forbid I reject somebody just because I want to, not because I'm attached to another man. Like these are like real things um, yeah. that women have to navigate in terms of excuses to not harm the fragile ego. Yeah. of the of the male right um so i guess yeah what we're saying is men need to i guess start calling each other out on and, and talking about what this has been like for women yeah and i think that that there's lots like there's a lot less information around that uh, about the male perspective of why they do it so we're like obsessively talking about is she empowered is she disempowered is this feminist? Right. not and i think it's just one big distraction from like why do men rape all the time why do men kill women all the time in all different cultures? Whether you're privileged or not, you'll be affected by, by male oppression and violence. But people don't like those conversations. That's really uncomfortable for them. So let's like dissect whether a music video, which was completely empowered and right. you know, let, let's, let's spend all our time talking about that, which is interesting and has like really amazing debate around it. But, but why not, like, like many, many, many things have been said recently. It's like, why are we not talking about why men are doing this and that. Like, why are we always talking about female bodies in this way? I feel like it's just this kind of quite sick distraction from real conversations uh, about male um, violence and, vi and, and rape culture. Like we just talk, I swear we talk half less about whether a female is feminist or not, or good enough or not in her feminism. Why are we even talking like that about women? I just think that it's just, it just seems kind of horrendous to be speaking about women this way, like when, when women are finally taking agency and 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 feeling like they can express their own sexualities and their own um, bodies, let them and then talk about why men rape. I don't know, it's just like yeah. those conversations are just not being had. Those male commentators uh, are often talking about women and, and dissecting what women should be doing, but they don't go like, why are my male friends like potentially one of them's rape since there's so many rape cases, maybe one of my male friends has raped someone which means that I'm actually friends with someone who might have abused someone. Like that is so much harder for a man than to make their own judgments about whether women are empowered or not. I mean, that must be much tougher. And I think that's why they don't, those conversations don't happen and what you're doing with Tender is the New Tough and having real conversations with men who are able to be vulnerable and like kind of radically honest. That will be the healing rather than, you know, being in this huge debate about women's bodies. It just, it's wrong, mm. I think, personally. Yeah, it doesn't feel... Um... It doesn't feel sacred. It doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel like recognizing the actual, uh, not power, not beauty. I don't know. It just feels like blame game. Like let's shift because we're afraid of the truth in ourselves. So let's just, like you said, distract ourselves or change the conversation to make it about the person experiencing it rather than the person who caused the experience to happen in the first place. And to talk about like, I think I was going to start talking about rape culture, but we're not because it's like 10 to whatever time we're all in. Um, but yeah, there's a, this is a big conversation. And I yeah, think it's a big conversation. there's many angles to look at. Yeah. Um, I'm glad it started. I'm glad that this is happening now because I think that if any, if, if particularly if there's any men that are, that are kind of tweaked about this and going, what, what are they talking about? I want them to get in touch with me. Um, and so we can talk about tender is the new tough. Um, we are kind of wrapping it up now. Just, I wanted to ask you one quick question, Kaylee, about the dog that you rescued. <laughs> um, oh, she's like, uh, there we go. Cause yeah. I don't know if you can see. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Lily, right? No, 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 Layla. Layla, that's it, Layla. So um, Melissa and her dog are gonna be back in the country next week. I'm sure you guys probably meet up for a coffee date because those two dogs would love each other. <laughs> 
Oh, that'd be so nice. Mago is so, um, I would show you her, but she's, um, I'm not going to show her. <laughs> she's on it. She's adorable. That's fine. Um, Kaylee, thank you so, so much um, for this this very open and honest and vulnerable um, conversation. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, how much I appreciate what you're doing. I, I told you the other day how much I can I can just feel your energy through your Instagram and you are you are changing. You are making positive change. So please keep doing what you're doing. Um, how can people get in touch with you if you want them to? By it's Instagram or whatever. What's your Instagram? Yeah, Kaylee Hombo, my 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 name. Okay, I'll if you, if you want me to, I can put it in the in the link if if you want anybody to to um to get to follow you on Instagram because I think it's amazing work what you're doing. Um, Melissa, final word from you. Oh no, this is great, and I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation and really like thinking about actively um, getting some male allies to to start this conversation without it being on the responsibility of the women to, to kind of lead it and have it. But like I said to you before we started recording is like, I am an actual fan and it does resonate with me, your work in terms of the like, like let's, why do we have to be ashamed of, of what this like body suit we're in right now and like really take reclaiming our own kind of whatever we need to reclaim. So yeah, and um, in the way that we want, cause I'm not, I'm also not saying this, you know, people who choose to be modest, that's great too. Women can be modest, women can cover up, women cannot cover up. It's not like saying that everyone should be painted nude and be nude all the time. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm just saying women should be able to express themselves as they want to. Exactly. So that's it, it's not, not in a specific way that I'm saying, like that they feel is right for them. And then mm -hmm. that's very personal and different for each person. So I just wanted to add a final note. <laughs> oh no, thank you for that because that's what people need to know is that it looks different. Expression and agency looks different for everyone and there's no one nice, neat, pretty package. It's a hot mess of everything and yeah. in that hot messiness, it's actually quite beautiful and freeing, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah. So thank you for creating that space is what I'm going to say. All right. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Kaylee. You um, Melissa, what's the name of the workshop again the, 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 on Thursday, the title? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. It's something around, we're going to talk about boundaries. <laughs> yeah. So, um, folks join Great us on an expansion around boundaries or something. Yeah. Join it. It's about expansion around bound boundaries. Um, uh, join us Thursday exactly. at 2 PM for that workshop. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Kaylee. And we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.